Well, today, and I, I won't be too long today. Um, today is the Miracle Offering Sunday, and uh, we want to do that at the end and have time to pray and pray over this next year and ask God to do a miracle, not just in your life, but in the life of our church. And uh, so we want to um, have time to do that. But today, I'm going to talk to you about putting Christ back in Christmas. And you say, well, that's a Christmas message, and we hear Christmas messages every year, uh, so what is the reason that I should listen? Well, today I'm going to talk about something that I think is the most important thing about Christmas that we often overlook. And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture today that normally is not associated with Christmas. Uh, but we're going to look at that today. Now, I don't know about you, but I love Christmas. How many love Christmas? All right, you can clap. Raise your hand. Uh, online, those of you that are online, how many of you love Christmas? Well, we don't hear them. Okay, so, uh, but we're glad that you joined us today at Avalon Church. But I love Christmas. I love everything about it. I love the lights. I love the trees. I love the decorations. I love the food. I love the family gatherings. I, I just love everything about it. I love the church gatherings. But I also love the fact that we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I know. Christmas is a vital part of the gospel. And so here's what I've learned over the years. Christmas can be a blessing or a burden. Christmas can be a blessing or a burden. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, when you look at what Jesus did, that he came to live among men, and he came to be the sacrifice for our sins that is a blessing. I, I don't think you can look at it in any other way other than Christmas is a blessing. However, there are those that because of their circumstances. Maybe you lost a loved one and you feel lonely. Well, that's perfectly normal. And, and it's perf perfectly reasonable for you to have those emotions. Okay? Or, or maybe uh, you had some other loss and you're mourning that in your family. And maybe it just is painful uh, to be reminded of that. And so when you come to Christmas and you understand it that way, you, you've had some kind of experience, then the blessing of Christmas can become a burden of Christmas. Now, here's what I know. When you look at Jesus Christ and you recall what he did and you recall why he came and why we celebrate Christmas, uh, no, matter, no matter what kind of burden you may have at Christmas time, no matter what kind of loss you may have, you can put your eyes on Jesus and everything's going to be a blessing. Can I get an amen right there? Somebody ought to be acting like we're in church today, all right? The fact is, um, it is a blessing to know that Jesus came at Christmas. He is the reason for our joy. Now, when we focus on Christ, it helps us celebrate the gospel. It reminds us that Christ came to forgive, redeem, give new life, and it relieves us of the stress of having to try so hard, and it frees us to receive God's grace. Now, here's, here's the, the fact. Um, when we approach Christmas... The same way that many people approach Christianity, which is, it's a works-based thing. you got to do better. you got to be that person that is perfect. When you do that, Christmas is a burden. Christmas is not really that enjoyable. But when you focus on Christ, yes, there are stresses, and yes, you may have losses, and yes, there may be painful things that go along with that, but when you focus on Jesus and you, when you put Christmas or Christ back in Christmas, then it's going to be a blessing. And, and I'm excited today uh, to talk about this and remind us that God does not use perfect people. He uses forgiven people. He doesn't use perfect people. So if you're trying for the perfect Christmas and you're stressing out, then stop. Don't worry about it. Put your eyes on Jesus and put Christ back in Christmas and everything's going to be okay. And so we need to learn to put Christ back in Christmas. I heard of a dad that was taking a nap 
he had a young son, and his son was like, Dad, I want you to come play with me. I want you to come play with me. I want you to come play with me. He kept on bugging his dad. And his dad, it was a Sunday afternoon, he's like, I got to take a nap. Sunday afternoon is for naps. That's the 11th commandment. Thou shalt take a nap on Sunday afternoon, right? That's, is that something like that, right? Um, so anyway, the boy just wouldn't leave him alone. So finally, the dad had an idea. He saw this picture of a world in a magazine in their house. So he tore this page out, and he tore the picture of the world into tiny pieces. And he said, now, son, when you get the world put back together, then we'll play. And he figured that would be good for a couple hours, and he'd get his nap in, and then he'd be able to play with his son. So the little boy went away, and about 10 minutes later, the dad was just getting into that dozing uh, uh, part of his nap, just about to go full-on nap mode, you know. And the boy comes running in the room. He says, Dad, I'm finished. I got the world together. And his dad sat up, kind of rubbed his eyes. He said, Son, how in the world did you get that puzzle put together so quickly or that, that uh, world put together so quickly? And the boy looked at him and he said, Dad, it was easy. He said, There was a person on the back of that page. And when I got my person together, the world was okay. And I don't know about you, but this Christmas, I'd like to get my person together. I'd like to get my person together because I'm going to tell you, we talk about here at Avalon Church, it's the perfect place for imperfect people. I know I'm not perfect, and I know you're not perfect, and if we can get our person together, then Christmas is going to be okay. The world is going to be just fine, but we got to get our person together. And there's one way. There's one way. There's one way to get your person together, and that is to focus on Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen, church? We've got to get our person together. And here's what I know. You get your person together, COVID-19 takes care of itself. Well, I, I realize it's problematic, and I realize we've got a ways to go, but get your person together, the world's going to be okay. Maybe your job, you got stress. Get your person together. Everything's going to be okay. Maybe you're uh, one of these moms that you invite everybody in your family to your house on Christmas and you just take on the load, you got to clean the house, you got to fix the food, you do all this stuff and people offer to help. You're like, no, 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 no. But in your heart, you're like, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. This is so much work. Nobody helps. Nobody appreciates me and you're stressed out. Here's what I know. You get your eyes on Jesus and you'll get your person together and Christmas is going to be okay. And so today I want to read from a passage of Scripture that's going to help you get your person together. And it's not typically a Christmas passage. We don't normally associate it with Christmas, but it is about Christmas. And it's found in 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to read four verses, verses 1 through 4. Now, by way of introduction, let me just say this. For some of you, you don't know who John is and you don't know much about 1 John. So let me explain it to you very briefly so everybody will know what we're talking about. Uh, John was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, all right? Now, Jesus had many, many followers, thousands, tens of thousands that followed him. He had hundreds that were disciples that followed him wherever he went, but he had 12 that he chose that were part of his inner circle. They were his disciples. They became the apostles of the church. So, of the 12 apostles, there were three that were in Jesus' inner circle, uh, James and John and Peter, all right? And those three, Peter, James, and John, uh, they made up Jesus' closest friend. John, however, was referred to as the beloved disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved. We believe that John was Jesus' closest personal friend here on this earth. So he was very close. He was one of Jesus' disciples. Now, if you're new to Christianity or new to reading the Bible, and you've started maybe in the New Testament, maybe you got as far as the Gospel of John. Now, the Gospel of John was written by John, okay? That's the reason it's called John, all right? Uh, if, if Richie wrote a book uh, called Richie, it would not be hard to figure out who wrote the book of Richie, all right? So, but John wrote the Gospel of John. 
And maybe if you're starting out reading, you find later on you look, there's, there's not only the Gospel of John, but then there's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and you have no clue what that means. We actually say 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Why do we say that? Because those are letters that were written to the church, real life people, and John wrote 1 John first. Come on, guys. You would fail if you're in third grade. All right, so uh, let's, let's do better. All right, so he wrote 2 John second. There you go. You get it. He wrote 3 John no, fifth. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It was third. So uh, the, the fact is, John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he also wrote the book of Revelation, if you want to get confused by all that. All right? So uh, John was the person, the person. If anybody could tell us what Jesus was like, John could do it. You know why? Because he was not just an apostle and a disciple, but he was also in Jesus' inner circle and he was Jesus' closest friend. Now, the interesting thing about John is that he thought that Jesus was the Son of God. In fact, he didn't just think it. He was convinced of it. And so, when you look at the Gospel of John and the book of 1 John, there are some parallels. In uh, the book of First, or the Gospel of John, rather, before we read uh, 1 John. In the, in the Gospel of John, here's how it starts. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things that were made were made by Him. And Jesus, it says in, in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, that Jesus was the light of the world, uh, that He came into this world uh, to give people light, to make them right with God, and so on and so forth. Now, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Does that sound like another verse in the Bible? The book of Genesis, where everything started. And the very beginning, where we look at God. This idea that God is the one that created. God is the one that we worship. And guess what Genesis chapter 1, and verses 1 and 2 says. It says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was, uh, without, was void and without form. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. So John, in writing the Gospel of John, he tied it to this vision of who God was. And he was convinced that Jesus was God. That Jesus was not only human, but he was God. So with that in mind, uh, let's pick up and we'll read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what he said. Here's what he wrote. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. He's talking about Jesus. He existed from the beginning. Jesus did not begin to exist when he was born in a physical body. Jesus existed in eternity past as a part of the Trinity. Uh, we believe that there is one God manifested in three persons. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, that's Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, So he's referring to Jesus as he was a part of the Trinity, a part of the Godhead. He said he was existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. Let me ask you a question. How many have ever heard or seen God in a real life body? Anybody? Please don't raise your hand because that would not be true. All right. Uh, you would be deceived by that. All right. Uh, no one has seen God. Now, you may have seen an angel. My wife has seen angels. I've seen angels before. The Bible says that some people uh, entertain angels without even realizing it. The Bible talks about that we have guardian angels, and so that I believe in angels. Uh, but the fact is, I've never seen the face of God. And so what John was doing here was he was setting up Christmas. He was setting up the gospel. He said Jesus was from the beginning, and actually I've seen and heard him. So if you're wondering about what John thought about Jesus, he said, no, he was God from the beginning, and I've actually seen and heard him. Then he goes on. He says, we saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He's tying it all together. He said, this is... Uh, this one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father 
and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And by having fellowship, he's talking about being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the whole point. Now, did you get from what we've read so far that he saw Jesus, that he touched him, that he heard him, that he was there with him? I mean, he just kept saying it over and over and over and over again. And then he goes on and says, And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Now, in some translations, it reads this way, so that our joy may be complete. Now, I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But in this passage, there are a couple of things that I want you to see, and I believe they will help you uh, and me understand how to keep Jesus in Christmas. How to keep Christ in Christmas. The first thing is this. you got to celebrate the meaning of Christmas. you got to celebrate the meaning of Christmas. Now, what we read in the passage that I just read was about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And that actually is the point of that whole passage, the incarnation of Christ. Now, some of you may not know what that means. The word incarnation is a fancy word. And all it means is that Jesus became human. That's all it means. The incarnation of Christ means that Jesus became human. Now, let me explain to you why this is so vitally important. First of all, because of our sin, there, if God was going to forgive us, there had to be a way for sin to be judged and sin to be punished. There was no human being that was righteous enough to die for all of humanity. It was just impossible. But there needed to be a human that became our representative. And in spite of everyone that's been born since Adam, uh, no one, even the best person in the world, was able to represent humanity because every person has sinned. Every person has failed. If you don't believe that we're born sinners, just look at a little toddler. Look at a little child. You don't have to teach them how to lie. You don't have to, te have to teach them how to steal. You don't have to teach them how to cheat. You have to beat it out of them not to do that. Okay? I mean, look at a child. One child has a pile of toys this high, and another child has only one toy. And what toy does this one want? The one that this one has. We have a sin nature. So Jesus could not have been born in a normal way with a human father. But in order for um, God to die, which really had to happen uh, because death was necessary because of the punishment of sin, and God was the only one that could pay for all of the sin of humanity in one fell swoop because he was able to absorb all of the wrath of God toward every sin that has ever been committed. And, of course, we know that in order for God to be able to die and pay for our sins, he had to become human. God could not die. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And so the only way possible for God to die and the only way possible for a human to be perfect was for God to enter into humanity. And that is the meaning of Christmas. When God enters into humanity. And that is exactly what Jesus did. That's why the virgin birth is so important. The Bible tells us that uh, Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit. So uh, Jesus had an earthly mother, and he had an earthly stepfather, but not a physical father. The God the Father was his father, and Jesus was born, and he was born without a sin nature, and so he was God, so he was without sin, and yet he entered into humanity as a human being. Now, can you imagine that? God in diapers. The architect of the universe, the one that Genesis says, oh, and he created the stars also. Just like an afterthought, no big deal. I'll just sprinkle the universe out. The one that created the universe, having an earthly stepfather, teaching him how to hold a hammer. And be a carpenter. Can you imagine? I mean, the fact that Jesus became human is mind-boggling. 
And because he became human, he not only could represent us, but listen, he, he was able to identify with us. And, and even though in every religion in the world, uh, you really can't know their version of God. Islam, you cannot know God. You can only know the will of Allah. You cannot be personally connected with Allah. And you take all the other major religions in the world, uh, uh, other than Judaism, there is really no way to know God personally. But God, the, the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, he stepped into humanity. He was born of a virgin. He was trained. He was raised. He was hungry. He went to sleep. He had all human emotions like we have, yet he was without sin. And the Bible tells us that because of that, he is able to identify with us. He, is under, he understands our temptations. He understands our hurts and pains. Because every hurt, every pain you've ever experienced, he experienced. Every sorrow you ever experienced, he knows what it was and what it's like. Oh, it is the greatest thing in the world. It is the greatest story in the world. The meaning of Christmas, if you don't get anything but this today, the meaning of Christmas is very clear. It's very clear. It is God with us. God became human. Emmanuel, God with us. The one that in, in John chapter 1, talking about John, that he wrote this. Uh, John chapter 1. Uh, it says, and I believe it's verse 14, that he dwelt among us. And that word in the Greek, it means that he tabernacled among us. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament? Remember, John is tying this whole thing together from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And he talks about the beginning and the Word, and he was there in eternity past. He's tying it all together. And if you recall, in the Old Testament, what did they do? Before they built the temple, they had a tabernacle. It was a big tent. And they had the Holy of Holies and the holy place and the candlesticks and the, the brazen altar and all of these different pieces of articles of furniture that were used in worshiping God. And when God tabernacled with the Israelites, you know what he did? You know what he did? The Bible tells us that he showed up like a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And he tabernacled with them. And John said, if you don't get anything, get this. He was here. I saw him. I touched him. He's God. And he tabernacles with us. He's there with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Why? Because he tabernacles with mankind. He tabernacles with you. And just like he was with the Israelites in the Old Testament, he'll be there during your daytime hours. He'll be there during your work. He'll be there during the times that you feel sorrow. And he'll be there at night during your darkest moments. He is a fire that will light your way. Why? Because he tabernacles with us. Why? Because he loves us. And he is Emmanuel. And he will never, ever leave us or forsake us. Wow, I, I didn't know there was that much in there, in that little passage. But yes, John said, we've got to remember the, the reason, the explanation of Christmas. We've got to understand the meaning of it. Well, I told you I'm not going to be very much longer, so, uh, or very long. I'm, I won't be much longer. Let, let me just give you these thoughts. Christmas is built on faith. John told his readers to have faith and believe in Jesus. And he did not say to have blind faith, but he gave eyewitness evidence that Jesus really existed. So if you're a skeptic today, God says you need to have faith. And some of you push back on that because you're like, well, you know, I've got to have some evidence. Well, you got more evidence than you can possibly handle in the fact that not only did John see him and he touched him and he, and he, he spoke with him. Uh, the disciples saw him. There were over 500 people at one time that saw him. They witnessed him. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fact. And you can bank on it and you can trust it. But yet, Christmas is built on faith. 
We believe that Jesus tabernacles with us. We believe that he came as a baby so that we could know the heavenly father. Number two, Christmas is built on doctrine. Some of you are like, oh, I don't use that word. Because when you think of doctrine, you think of somebody that's hard-headed and narrow-minded uh, or something that's boring. Doctrine only means teaching. That's all it is. A belief. Did you know that even atheists live their life by doctrine? You know what their doctrine is? They say, well, I don't believe there's a God, or I don't know if there's a God. Well, that's a belief. That's a doctrine. And yet God gives us this, this picture, this evidence that Jesus really was alive. Um, I, I'm going to skip over part of this and get toward the end. But Christmas is built on actual events. It, it's not a myth. You say, well, you know, some people say it's a myth. Well, if it's a myth, it's the worst myth ever. Let me tell you why. When the ancient writers would write, first of all, they did not include details that would make the main character, the hero, look bad. Remember, everybody, the winners write history. Everybody remember that? Okay. So it's the winners that look good, and they have people that write that make them look good. If you read the Gospels, you'll find that every stinking one of the disciples failed and failed miserably. You don't include that if you're not writing something that's true. You don't include details like when the, uh, when the disciples were uh, rowing across the lake and the storm came. You remember that? And they were about to drown and there Jesus came walking on the water. You remember that? Well, you know what? One of the details that we often read and we overlook as being unimportant, uh, it said that they rode about three, three and a half miles. You don't include details like that in uh, ancient uh, documents if, you're, if this is actually an ancient myth or an ancient mystery. And uh, another thing is you would not write stuff like what John wrote, that he saw him and that what Paul wrote, that there were over 500 witnesses at one time. You know why you wouldn't write that? Because the people were still alive when it was written. And if I wrote something and I said, let's say I wrote this, Avalon Church, uh, we went to the graveyard and we began to sing and everybody began to march around the graves and all these people rose from the dead. It was a great day. Let's everybody give everybody a hand for being here on the day that we resurrected half the graveyard from the dead. Well, do you know if that story began to circulate, do you know that it wouldn't take very much to disprove that? Because number one, the people are still alive and people would go and look and they'd say, no, we were there. There were no people that got up out of the grave. And by the way, if you want to go check, they're still in the grave. They could not do that with Jesus. You know why? There was never any controversy for the first 30, 40 years after Jesus was resurrected. Everybody just assumed that it was true because people were actually alive when it was written. Well, here's the thing. We've got to know the meaning of Christmas and then we've got to embrace the purpose of Christmas. Uh, the purpose of Christmas is that Jesus introduced the gospel to us. God wants to have a personal relationship with us. It's about connecting. And then you'll notice that John wrote, he said, look, I'm doing this. I want you to believe in this so it will complete our joy. And you know what John was saying? He was not suggesting that he had no joy. Because for a believer, we, are, we have a river underpinning us with joy. It flows in our spirit. And that doesn't mean we're happy about everything. It doesn't mean that we never get sad. It doesn't mean that. But it means that there is an underlying joy that strengthens us no matter what. So what was John talking about when he said, if you'll believe on Jesus, you will Notice what he said, complete our joy. You know what John uh, was saying? When people come to know Jesus, it completes our joy. When you begin to fellowship with the Father, you get saved. You begin to live a life that is transformed by the power of Jesus. There's great, great joy. When you get saved, 
not only do you have fellowship with the Father, but you have fellowship with other believers in the church. And you begin to meet, make friends. And you begin to meet people that are going to support you and help you and be with you. And it gives you great, great joy. I got to be honest. Every time I see somebody follow Jesus in baptism, it just tears me up a little bit. I have such joy. Every time I see one of you growing in your faith, doing what God has called us to do, you know what it does in my life? It gives me great joy. And that's what John was saying. He said, when you begin to follow Jesus, when you begin to believe in Jesus, it's going to cause joy. And not only does it cause joy in heaven, it causes joy here. You know what it says in the Gospels that when one sinner is found, heaven rejoices. And God rejoices. The angels rejoice whenever you make that choice to follow Jesus, to believe in Him, and to understand the meaning of Christmas. What is the meaning of Christmas? It's the incarnation. It is the fact that Jesus tabernacles with us. He lives here with us. And thank God, no matter what you've lost, no matter how, how sad you may be because of a husband or a dad or a mom or a wife um, that has already gone on to heaven, no matter how torn up you may be about the loss of something, when we put our eyes on Jesus and we keep Christ in Christmas, we are filled with unimaginable, indescribable joy. Amen? Amen. I believe it. Heavenly Father, I pray that today there will be people that will believe and they'll come to you as Savior and they'll receive you into their heart. And then, Lord, I pray that everyone that is already a believer, a follower of Christ, would be reminded that we need to keep Christ in Christmas. It is about the incarnation. It is about Jesus dwelling with us. And I pray that you'd work in people's lives right now. Before I finish my prayer, maybe today with your head bowed and those of you watching online, you listen closely. Maybe today you would say, I need to trust Christ. I need Jesus as my Savior. Well, I would invite you to follow Christ. Pray a simple prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you came to this earth and died for my sins and you resurrected from the grave. And I don't know everything about the Bible, but I do ask you right now to save me come into my life. I'm calling on you, Lord, to be my Savior. If you'll pray that prayer, I want you to hit that button while you're watching to let us know that you prayed to receive Christ. Do it now. Do it right now. If you prayed that prayer, do that right now. Don't wait. Don't forget. We need to follow up with you and rejoice with you. We want our joy to be full. We want our joy to be complete so that we can rejoice with you. And then I wonder if there's anybody in the congregation with our heads bowed that you'd say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer to receive Jesus, and I want you to know about it. Would you just raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it? Uh, I, um, I, can't, I see your hands. Yes, I see you there. Four, five. Wonderful. Five people that I can see. You can put your hands down. Anybody that didn't raise your hand then, but you want to raise your hand because you received Christ today in the audience today, anybody else that I can see? Well, God bless you. Thank you, everyone that raised your hand. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Take the next step card and put your name on it and your email address or phone number and check that you prayed to receive Christ today. Father, we thank you for every person that's doing this and receiving this today. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us today to keep Christ in Christmas. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today is our Miracle Offering Sunday. And for those of you that are new to Avalon Church and you don't know what the Miracle Offering is, every year at Christmas we take an offering, and it's an offering of thanksgiving. It's an offering that we're sowing into the next year. We're sowing into seeing people saved. Are you glad that five people raised their hand and got saved today? This is what it's about. John wrote, when you believe, you complete our joy. And that's what we're rejoicing over, okay? And so you're sowing into the next year. You're sowing seed. You're asking God to give you direction for your life. You're praying for a miracle in your life. You're asking God to do something great, to change your mind. 
And when you pray this, God will do it. And so it is our greatest offering of the year. Uh, we put uh, a great emphasis on this. And uh, so I would encourage you today. Um, online, let me deal with you first. Just on that giving app, you can do it. And I pray that you'll do it. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Do it now. And if you want to give in the regular offering, that's fine. If you want to give in the miracle offering, that's fine too. Uh, or you can text to give, 84321. That's a very simple way. Or you can give online at avalonchurch.net. But for all of us here, we're going to come forward and put our miracle offering in. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You can drop it in the drop box on the way out. But every year, we like to do this. And here's the reason why. We want you to pray when you put your offering in. And we want this next year to be a greater year for you. How many would like it if 2021 was better than 2020? Would you raise? I got both hands raised. And we know that God is in control, but we're praying for this, okay? We're praying that we can get our kids back in school, that we can get everybody coming back to church again, that everything can be back to normal, whatever that means, uh, again. And so you come and pray about that. Or maybe there's a loved one you're praying for, or you're praying for a friend or somebody to be saved. So we want you to do that and make that uh, make that commitment. If you gave online to the miracle offering and you'd like to come and pray, you just come up and pray, okay? And then that'll be our offering. Then you go back to your seat. Let's everyone stand together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless this offering. Thank you for every person here. I pray that you'd bless every person that gives in this offering. Help us to see what you're doing in our house, what you're doing in our midst, and we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.